The Sovereign is a coin with a very long history. It goes all the way back to the reign of Henry VII when it's initially struck under the first Tudor monarch. And it's this powerful expression of might and the authority of the new Tudor dynasty. And it's struck under all of the Tudor monarchs all the way up until James I. And that's where it ceases. And it ceases for about two centuries until it's revived at the start of the 19th century. And it's revived in 1817 as part of a whole series of coinage reforms that helped sweep away the chaos that happened to the economy during the Napoleonic Wars. And what we see with these new sovereigns, these modern sovereigns that come about in 1817, is the physical expression of the gold standard. They are literally are worth their weight in gold. And this is the coin really which becomes preeminent throughout the 19th century. So as British interests expand, as you get the expansion of the British Empire around the globe, so too you get the expansion of the gold sovereign. So it goes all the way around the globe and circulates internationally. And the reason why you end up circulating internationally is not just because of the British interest and the British Empire, it's because the coin is struck to such very, very tight tolerances. And that means that people who receive it can trust it and rely upon it. And as a result of that, you get accounts of people you know, trekking through the jungles of Brazil, taking bags full of sovereigns, full well knowing that wherever they end up, they can use these gold coins. Countries like Portugal as well, which have no connection to Britain uh, officially, also accept the coin as legal tender. And that is why by the end of the 19th century, it's referred to by some as the chief coin of the world. It's sort of equivalent to thinking about the American Express card of its day accepted and traded wherever coins are accepted and traded. That was the sovereign in the 19th century. And that explains why the Royal Mint has to turn out tens upon tens upon tens of millions of them throughout the 19th century. And it also explains why we end up establishing branch mints all over the globe. So it makes much more sense to establish branches close to local sources of gold rather than shipping that gold all the way in its raw form from say Australia or Canada to the UK to be turned into sovereigns and then just to be sent back out around the world. So the first branch of the Royal Mint opens in Sydney in 1855, and that is followed by two other branches in Australia, in Melbourne and Perth. And they follow this classic model of being established close to natural sources of gold. The gold can be mined, refined, and then turned into gold sovereigns directly at source. And then they were then put out into circulation to go around the world. The branch mints fulfilled a huge number of sovereigns. They made masses of them throughout that period. And they were very, very important to that international circulating matrix. In addition to those in Australia, you end up with ones in South Africa, which opens just after the First World War. You have a short-lived wartime expedience in Bombay in India, striking sovereigns for just one year in 1918. And you also get a branch in Canada, in Ottawa, which opens in 1908. Canada is never very successful as a branch, doesn't make that many sovereigns. In fact, India strikes more sovereigns in one year than Canada strikes throughout its entire time as a branch of the Royal Mint, which makes Canadian sovereigns particularly tricky to get hold of sometimes. The sovereign therefore becomes to embody more than just a coin. So what you start to see with the sovereign is the physical embodiment of the pride and the prestige of Britain and more widely its empire. And that is why people see it as a really powerful symbol, particularly at the end of the 19th and at the start of the 20th century. And it really does embody this might that you get with the British Empire at its pomp. And it explains why you see certain things. So you end up with a sovereign embedded into the end of Blackrod's staff. So Blackrod is the gentleman usher of the House of Commons. He's the chap that walks in front of the king as it is now and bangs on the door with a staff to gain admittance to the House of Commons. And at the end of that staff from which he's banging on the doors of the Commons is a 1904 sovereign. And that speaks volumes about how the British public and the British establishment saw this coin at the start of the 20th century. They really were speaking volumes about its pride, its prestige in the nation and the empire more generally. And what we have to remember is these are circulating gold coins. You know, you could use these in day-to-day -day transactions. This is part of your change. Effectively, you're putting the nation's gold reserve into active use. It is being frittered away daily by people using it, you know, being worn from hand to hand and in purse to purse. You know, dentists are melting it down to go into fillings. The nation's gold reserve being frittered away on a daily basis. It's a massive, massive luxury. And it's a huge luxury in peacetime, but it's completely and utterly impractical during wartime. And what kills off the circulating gold coinage is the First World War. And the first casualty of the Great War is the circulating gold coinage. As the Chancellor of the Exchequer, David Lloyd George, stands up in the House of Commons in August 1914 and proclaims that if anybody's using gold or hoarding gold, they're helping the enemy more effectively than if they were taking up arms to fight against Britain. And as a result of that, sovereigns and half-sovereigns are replaced with banknotes. And that ceases this golden age of the sovereign as a circulating gold coin in Britain. But what you still have 
is this massive, massive appeal internationally. And whilst it is no longer backed officially, sovereigns still do circulate internationally to a degree. And so the branch mints continue to produce sovereigns after the First World War, even though in London they ceased to be struck uh, in 1917. Which explains why the branches go all the way up until the 1930s in some cases. Those coins are not necessarily going into active circulation as we understand it. They're going to bank vaults, and to back up the reserve, you know, the actual paper currency being used. But there is still this demand for sovereigns around the world. So trusted and relied upon is it that people want to have access to it. And that explains why the Roman has to come back to making sovereigns in the 1950s. So the branches cease production in the 1930s. And what happens is you have this complete gap. There is no longer any sovereigns being made to fill this massive global demand which perversely isn't there in Britain. And there isn't this demand for sovereigns in Britain in the same way that you get in places like the Middle East or overseas. But because there is no production of new sovereigns, you end up with counterfeiters stepping in to fill that void. And they start to produce counterfeit sovereigns to meet that demand, that huge demand that's present in the 40s and 50s. And that is why the Roman in part comes back to producing sovereigns in the late 1950s is to meet this huge demand for this coin around the globe, which at that present time is currently being filled by counterfeiting activities. And from the 1950s onwards, late 1950s onwards, you get this regular production of bullion sovereigns, which are not for use in the UK, but which are sold overseas onto the international markets, to places like the Middle East or through Switzerland, all over the world, the Far East, to meet that huge demand for bullion sovereigns and bullion use. That continues right through up until the early 1980s. And it continues right through after the mint leaves London. So the last coin struck in London at Tower Hill is a 1974 sovereign, which is struck in November 1975. Production continues down in Clantrisson when we move from London down to Wales. And you get production of 1970 dated sovereigns, early 1980 dated sovereigns as well. But the last bullion sovereign struck down here for a little while is in 1982 and end up with this hiatus right through until the early 2000s when we finally get bullion sovereigns returned to us in the year 2000. And from there on on we've got this regular production of bullion sovereigns yet again. That said, the proof sovereign has been going throughout all of this time. The proof sovereign as we have it today, the annual issue of proof sovereigns come back in 1979. And then you get this annual issue of proof sovereigns and proof gold sovereign sets. That continues even though you have this hiatus of bullion production in the 80s and 90s and they've become very, very popular with the collector market. The sovereign really is this great survivor. It should not still be with us today, really, to be honest. It should have been killed off by the First World War. To be honest, it should have been killed off after the Tudors stopped making it, but we still have it. And I think that's because of this great psychological hold it has on the psyche in this country, but also around the world. It has become ingrained into people as being a coin that's, you know, trusted and accepted and reliable. And that's why people continually come back to it. The psychological draw of the British Gold Sovereign is huge.